A quick review. So as I stated, when it comes to understanding beams in terms of how they deform, it's due to the interaction in terms of how the beam is constrained and the position of the deforming log to the beam to instigate that moment of bending or what's called the bending moment. So it's the bending moment that causes the structure to either bend inwards, so that will be sagging, or to bend outwards. So that'll be hogging. So sagging, hogging. So this is essentially what will happen. Now, when you have a situation whereby the structure is either in, in the state of sag or in the state of hog, the different surfaces will be under two different measures of stress. So if we're looking at a structure similar to what we have here, whereby you've got a deforming load that has a negative sense to cause the structure to bend inwards, the part that caves in from the neutral axis will be in the state of compression and the outer part is being stretched. So that part there, this part here, will be in the state of tension. So when it comes to analyzing the uh, the parameters of stress for beams is quite complex because you're going to have two states of shear. And it's very important that you understand what the magnitude of the bending stresses are to identify which parts or which surface of the beam would more or less fail first. So in your analysis, the one that has the higher value of stress, that's where you need to be a bit concerned about particularly the relationship of that surface to the deforming load. So as I stated, at the neutral axis, the value of stress will be at its minimum, which will be equal to zero. So at the neutral axis, there won't be any increase or decrease in stress. Stress will be equal to zero. So depending on how far you want to identify the measure of stress, that will more or less depict this value of y. So for us to calculate or to predict where the highest compressive stress is, it will just be the distance from the neutral axis to the outermost surface, which is experiencing compression. And it's vice versa for that section of the beam that's experiencing tension. So that will be the distance from the neutral axis to the outermost section of that section of the beam that is just, that's more or less experiencing tension. Okay, so that's essentially what's going on here. So I've indicated that to calculate the maximum value of y, you need to measure the distance from the neutral axis to the outermost surface of the beam. But if it's just in terms of any instance, then you can always vary the value of y. But as designers, your interest is more about the maximum value to enable you identify what you need to do to ensure that the integrity of the beam is sustained during its operational life. So is it by changing the material requirements or the geometric profile? And if so, how do you go about varying or distorting or changing the sectional profile to ensure that um, the neutral axis, so if you reduce the neutral axis, you're going to have greater resistance in terms of compression against tension or vice versa. So again, your objectives will more or less qualify what the design intent needs to be. So. When it comes to using um, the flexural formula, we're assuming a state of pure bending. So similar to what we've been talking about regarding your spaghetti braid structures, if we place the deforming load perfectly central to your structure, then that's more or less uh, characterizing pure bending. So the only mode of deformation will be bending. So we're not expecting any variance or any offset of uh, the deforming load to the central plane of the structure. Otherwise, it will instigate torsion or twisting, which will then negate um, using the flexural formula. So you have to look at 
what the resultant is due to bend it and um, distortion due to uh, twist it. So these are the assumptions when it comes to uh, analyzing the beam structure in terms of uh, pure bending. So uh, one of the things is the assumption that the material is sectionally and continuously more or less the same material throughout. So this concept would not be ideal for composites in particular. So you need to you need to be very careful about that. If it's a composite, like a bimetallic strip or anything that's been infused with a different uh, material, then you can't use that. That doesn't make it homogeneous. And isentropic is more or less assuming that the flow of stress is along the uh, longitudinal plane of a given beam section. So we don't normally factor uh, the lateral um, measure of strain. So that's not quantified here. So since the material is homogeneous, then we're more or less going to assume that for each um, segment of um, a given beam structure, the Young's modulus and the elastic modulus will be the same in terms of uh, compression and tension. So the value of E will not change. And we're also going to assume that if it was slicing the beam along its longitudinal plane, then when the beam bends, the layers, okay, or the filaments that constitute the beam will more or less be in parallel to the neutral axis. So when the neutral axis is bent, that will more or less define what's called the radius of curvature, okay? Because when it bends, you're going to get an arc, and that arc will more or less have some form of radii. So there you go. Um, in terms of this uh, area, we're assuming that the material is deformed within its elastic region. Thus, the transverse area, the cross-sectional area, will always remain in plane and parallel to the surface of the structure. So we're not expecting any distortion in the cross-sectional profile. So it will more or less be the same as if it was not loaded in the first instance. Bender is not dependent on shear loads, but it's more or less the other way around. Bending induces shear loads along the beam because you've got that offset between the deforming load and the reactions at the point of constraint. So that measure of offset will cause uh, shear distortions along the beam. However, shear loads can be in any plane and that will not necessarily instigate bending. So this is basically what this what this part means, and we'll look at that part um, in greater depth when we uh, progress to part B. And the next part is that we don't quantify the effects of residual stresses within the structure. So residual stresses are more or less uh, a result of post manufacturing uh, defects within um, the material. So those bits are ignored. So we, these are not factored in. Um, the analysis. Okay, so this is why it states that internal stress is purely longitudinal and local effects are ignored. So that's essentially the assumption that we make when it comes to analyzing um, beam structures. So, how do we go about performing um, some mechanical principles when it comes to beams? We use this almighty formula called the bending formula or the uh, Fletcher formula. So the Fletcher formula will have three ratios. You've got M divided by I is equal to sigma divided by Y equals E divided by R. It's not as complicated as you think. It all comes down to what variables do you know and what variables don't you know, and to what pair of the equation is required to for you to work out um, parameters based on what your uh, analytical objectives are. So you can either use this pairing, so mi is equal to sigma over y, or sigma over y is equal to e over r, or m divided by i is equal to e divided by r. So it all comes down to what you know about the material and the geometric profile of um, a given beam structure. So there you go. So M characterizes the bending moment. So the unit for bending moment is Newton meter. Okay. 
we've all had a, a detailed look in terms of what I represent. So I represents the geometric uh, resilience of a given B structure based on this section of profile. So that is I, and that's in meters to the power of four. When it comes to the bending stress, it's the same value as axial stress. So that is Newton per meter squared or Pascal. Why? So we need to be very careful with why. Why is the distance from the neutral axis of the beam to any instance um, normal to the neutral axis? So we need to be very careful of that, okay? So in this context, we're looking for the distance from the neutral axis to the outermost surface or surfaces of the beam, depending on if we're interested in calculating compressive strength or the tensile strength, depending on how the beam is deforming. E is the Young's modulus. So that's basically the materials measure of how a given uh, part is countering or resisting deformation. So that's essentially what E is. And R is simply the radius of bend or the radius of curvature. So there you go. So we're going to go back to um, the previous example. So the previous example stated that we needed to predict what the stresses are in the beam, assuming that the beam is experiencing a bending moment of 800 uh, Newton meter. So we've already calculated the value of I. So we calculated the value of I from um, the previous example to be 2.08 times 10 to the power minus 7 meters to the power 4. So this is what the state of deformation will be for the given T section. So above the neutral axis, because the structure is in a state of sag or it's sagging, the upper part is curving in or caving in. Thus, the upper part will be in compression and the outer part or this um, section of the beam below the neutral axis will be in a state of tension. So this characterizes the two states of stress that the beam will be experiencing. So this can be represented graphically like so. So as I stated, from the neutral axis where stress is equal to zero, as you move away from the neutral axis going up, the measure of stress increases because in terms of the radius of curvature, the farther you go, the, the longer, uh, the greater the, there would be in terms of a reduction in curvature towards the surface and is vice versa moving outwards to the part that is stretching the most. So in comparison to the neutral axis, you're going to have greater elongation of the longitudinal filaments of the beam section on the outermost surface. Well, this is a graphical representation of that. So here, the negative region denotes compression and the positive region denotes tension. So from there, we can then use the previous uh, calculations that we did to figure out what is the measure from the neutral axis to the outermost section. So the total length of the beam, I believe was given as, I don't even remember, was it 50, I believe? Yeah, I think it might be 50. So to work out the distance here, that will be the total distance minus Y bar. So that gave um, 15. And we know what um, that would be in terms of tension would be the same as y bar, the distance from there to there. Thus, yt in terms of y with respect to um, the atomal surface of the beam in tension, that would be 35. So based on what we know, we can then decide on what pairing of the equation that we can use in calculating the stress. So We've been given the bending moment, so we know that to be 800. We've calculated the value of I, and we know what the values of Y max is in terms of state of compression and state of tension. And we just need to make sigma the subject of the relationship to calculate what the compressive and tensile stresses are. So if we make sigma the subject, then the bending stress is equal to M divided by I times y max. So for compressive stress, y would be equal to 15. For tensile, y would be equal to 35. So fairly straightforward stuff. Okay, so by 
inputted and doing the needed computation based on the values we know. So remember, you need to ensure that you convert all your values in the basis of meters. So this is where you can easily make a mistake. Okay. So don't forget that that's for the fact that our values were predicted in millimeters. You need to convert from millimeters to meters. So once we do the needed computation, we get a value of 50.7.6 MPA. If you do likewise in terms of calculating the maximum bending stress of the segment under tension, we use the same uh, methodology. So um, the bending moment 800 times the distance from the neutral axis to the atomal surface of the surface under tension. So that would be 35 millimeters or 0 0.035 meters divided by the measure of the geometric resistance or uh, the value of I. And that gives 134.4 MPA. So you see that that is significantly larger in tension as compared to the value of stress under compression. So that's part of the reason why for um, applications where um, tensile load would be an issue, T-beams are normally not the way to go. So if you're going to put this in uh, context, so let's assume that this beam were to be extruded from, let's say, steel. So steel has um, a, uh, a value, a yield limit of 200 MPA. So if you look at the margin of safety, or if you want to call it um, the safety factor, that is quite close to 200 MPA compared to the, uh, the surface under uh, the highest state of compression. Thus, if you carry on increasing the load to instigate the magnitude of the bending moment, then the beam is going to start experiencing plastic deformation and eventually shear apart from the tensile surface compared to the compressive surface. So that is more or less a pragmatic way of contextualizing the values here. So hopefully all that is clear. Bye, bye, bye.